What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Of course, you know it's your boy Beehive Radio. Shout in. Stepping in the building, I got a friend to a show. I'm talking about one of the guys that helped me actually kick this platform off. I'm talking about a big wig when it comes to label executive positions. I'm talking about the CEO of Radar. I'm talking about a record breaker and a mover and shaker. My partner, them. Ray Daniels, what's good with it, what's boss? Poppin', what's popping? What's popping? Man, I always gotta hold good. my I always gotta hold my eyes down when people talk about me because it's so weird receiving it. But oh, I appreciate please. it. Please. No, Ray, first of all, man, you've been getting busy for so long, man. I mean, at every level that you could possibly think of in this hip hop game and just music industry in Thank general. You. For those that don't know and don't understand, what was it that got you into hip hop? Well, got me into hip hop working or as a fan? Working. Uh, somebody I went to high school with just mm-hmm. flagged me down on Old National one day and was like, yo, brother, I would love if you would help me with something. I didn't know what that something was. Yeah. You know, he called me every day for a month straight. Like, when you come into the house? When you come into the house? So I finally was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna come over. Went over and he just played the piano and sung and rap. And he was like, since we've been kids, you've always knew how to talk to people. Mm. If you could talk to people about w- what I'm doing, I think we can make a whole lot of money together. And I was like, maybe this is what God want me to do. Because I, I was actively searching for my purpose at that age. Weird. Mm-hmm. Oddly enough, I was actually like searching for my purpose. Like, what am I supposed to do in my life? Like, I got a job. I'm in junior college. But I, I'm only doing this because I feel like I'm supposed to. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So I actively searched and it found me. And, you know, I felt like I made a deal with God. I was like, I'm going to honor this at all cost, mm-hmm. at all loss. What was that first position that you got in the game, Ray? That is first first position that I got, mm-hmm. meaning as a worker. Well, it was working for him. It was funny because because he felt like I was one of his discoveries. Mm-hmm. He didn't necessarily call me his manager. Mm. Uh, I was kind of like the guy that worked for him, that did whatever he needed to do, that ran around for him. That he would say, you know, I need to get Greg Street over here. You yeah. know. I would go get Greg Street. He would say, you know, we need to get this person over here. I would go, I remember I bought Tony Draper to the house. And, mm. he, and you know, I would, but <laughs> knowing what I know now, we wasn't gonna go anywhere because we weren't, we weren't, because he didn't know what he wanted to do. Mm. He was kind of like, he was kind of like this most talented, it was like a big lesson I learned because he was so gifted, he was so talented, but he thought he was smarter than everybody. Uh. So he figured, so he would basically bring you to his house or me bring you to the house, have him play, have him rap, have him sing, have him do all these things that he could do and then get you excited and then be like, let me talk to you about my artists. So people would be like, well, aren't you the artist? No, 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 I'm the genius behind the artist. He would actually say that. (laughs) And you know, my my dumb ass, I'm just trying to, (laughs) you know, I'm just trying to prove myself. I'm, you know, I'm just every day, I'm buying into it, believing into something. And you know, when as I'm older, I re, as the more I got in the business, the more I was like, man, I'm glad I got out of there because that wasn't gonna work. He, 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 you know, in this game, you you need to know what you want to do or be open to somebody's suggestion. Mm-hmm. And he didn't know either. When you bust that first pivot, what was that like for you? Saying, okay, I got to get up out of here and find something else greater. And then was that a point in your life where you knew that the music industry was something that you would continue with? Or man, that's a that's a great damn question. Yeah. Nobody's ever asked me that. So this, I remember the day I left. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was telling me about this rap kid that he was about that we were about to sign, mm-hmm. and you know he was like he's the dopest, he's the dopest. And then I finally came to the house to because he had he lived in this weird thing. He lived in this like cottage where it was like uh, no no real electricity. All the mm-hmm. electricity was on the outside of the house. Only thing he had was a studio set up and like a fireplace in the middle. Of the, not even a fireplace, but. Something where you, the thing where you put the fire in and it burns around the whole house, something like a fire pit. So he had that. So I remember I came over the house one day and the kid that he was bragging on was a kid that I grew up with named Mm. Jay. And I remember I was like, this the Jay you been telling me about? He was like, yeah. So I was like, Jay, I didn't know you rap, man. It's dope. You know, we we knew each other since we was 12 years old. Now, you know, we 21. So I'm like, nigga, you rap? Let me hear you rap. And then he told him, don't rap for him. Like, but it was like, in a way it was like, don't rap for him. You don't have to rap for him. He don't. He do what I tell him to do. Uh, and I was like, and then and then I was like, nah, come on, come for real, man. Let me hear him rap. And Jay was, he was like, dog, don't rap for him. Trust me. I told you he good, he good. And then I just remember leaving. And I remember thinking like, well, maybe he's the guy that God sent to get me started. And I'll honor it still. And I remember from there, 
because I was bringing everybody to him, people saw me as being of value. So yeah, people right. were like, well, why don't you come help me? Exactly. So I was like, okay, but I, I still didn't know what I was. I could tell you the first time I was ever introduced as a manager because the artist that I was running around with, we was at Clark Atlanta and, and the Outlaws, Tupac Outlaws mm. pull up and they pulled up on us in this Range Rover and he was like, yo, they was like, come to the studio. And he was like, all right, come and bring my manager. And he pointed at me and that was the first time I was like, damn, I'm a manager. <laughs> so, cause for me, I didn't, I didn't even think I had, I didn't even have the balls to say what I was because I felt like I was saved from it. So mm. it's like, like, imagine somebody pull you into a room and say, all right, we in TV now. Like, yeah. in your mind, it's like, okay, cool, we in TV, but what do you want me to do? Exactly. You don't have to walk in there and be like, all right, I'm a producer now, everybody. I'm a yeah. so I, I didn't do that, so I kind of just played any role that was available with the hopes of like being a part of it. But the one thing I remember about myself was that people bought into me. Like, people came to old boy's house that got me into business because they believed in, cause I, like I made them believe that it was something that they was missing out on. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to the other situation, you know, we would be running around in New York and, and, and trying to get on and it would be me at the parties that everybody remembered. So people would be like, I like him, I like him. Yeah. But I didn't have a place in it. So it was like, I'm the same person I am now. I'm, I'm a hustler, I'm humble, I'm, I'm, I'm all those things, but I didn't know shit. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, they liked me, but I was kind of like, okay, so what can I do? And they was like, well, you're doing it. Shit. And I'm like, oh, well, what am I doing? Cause I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just running up in parties with CDs saying, you need to check us out. Exactly. It was like, that's it. You're doing the job. So, you know, I, it, so when he got rid of me, you know, and then that second people team that I went with got rid of me. Shit. Because what happened was, was that, like I said, you know, as you get older, you reflect and you start thinking, I just remember being the guy that was the guy that the people who we were doing business with like. So imagine mm -hmm. I work for Beehive and you know, your company and you know, you're like, Ray, we need some people in here. And I'm running out getting people and exactly. they don't really like Beehive. Yeah. They like, Ray. I'm only doing this interview cause Ray asked me. And yeah. then when Beehive is like, you could feel that, you know, yeah. people, I remember this, I remember the time that people got rid of me. They got rid of me over the dumbest thing. It was really because we were running around in New York and I was, I had the CDs on, the, this is like 2003. I had the, you know, you passing out the music with the CD, the number on it. Mm -hmm. My number wasn't on the CD. Mm. And I was the only person really in the streets passing them out. Yeah. So I had a big problem with that. And I would be like, yo, why can't my name be on the CD? Yeah. Like I'm the one that's like, yo, Working. Beehive, check this out. Exactly. Like you need it, this dude is this. So, and then some people will call and they will call these other guys. Mm -hmm. And they would be like, yeah, Ray, we got to meet with such and such. Oh, how do we meet him? Oh, he called when you gave him a CD. Bro, why can't I put my name on the CD? And they was like, nah, you gotta get, we got, you got to go. And they got rid of me. <laughs> and I remember feeling alone again, but by this time, so many people in the music industry who I looked up to told me I had it. Mm. So, and liked me genuinely. So that was when I was like, all right. And I remember when they was breaking up with me, the artists that we were pushing, they was like, we want to get rid of Ray. They want to get rid of me so bad that they told him, you can go with him if you want. We don't care. So I'm like, Bro, I don't, I'm broke, I don't have nothing. They was like, well, and, and, and they were so kind of said, it was like, well, I guess he's gonna have to figure out that you can't do anything for him. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I called a couple people that I knew and I was like, yo, those guys I was with was gone. You know, I hope you still wanna work with us. And they was like, what, they're gone? Oh my God, finally, this is what I want you to do. Get me this, get me that, get me this, get me that, I'm gonna put you in the game. And I did it all. And then I got in the game. And all those, and none of those guys even got close to the, you know, I guess if you want to call this the show that we are at, yeah. none of those guys got close to the show. So for me, you know, it was really like a blessing. It was God all day. Cause like I said, I was actively seeking something to, something to do, something to believe in. And when it came in my front door, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna honor this. I'm gonna do it right. Yeah. I'm not going to cheat it. I'm going to give it everything I got. And then, and here I am monetizing your passion though, Ray, because so often as a manager and somebody that makes it do what it's supposed to do, it's difficult to monetize that. So how did you keep from finding yourself working and helping every damn body out without helping yourself? Well, good, good question again. I remember my first artist, he got his deal and he lived with me. I did everything, mm -hmm. I did everything. You know, he was, 
he was in and out of the hospital. He was, you know, it, nobody was involved. And I remember, you know, it was time to finally get a deal. And I just remember, you know, mind you, B.I., I did everything. Shit. When I mean I did everything, meaning he didn't know the producers. He didn't know nobody. He just showed up, and I did my part. So, and it goes back to that, what I said. They believed in me. Mm -hmm. So they knew I believed in him. So they was like, we're going to do this with him. So I remember when we finally got his deal, and I'm thinking to myself, like, mind you, I'm homeless. I don't got nothing. I'm thinking to myself, like, man, I'm finally about to get a a check from the business. You know, I've been yeah. hustling this shit for like two years. And I remember I was like, yo, so manager get 20%. And, and then his mom was like, you ain't no damn manager. My, my son helped you. Oh! And the crazy thing is that you never forget that because that was the first time. And this is how I know God is real. I'm telling y'all, this is how I know God is real. Let me tell you why. Because it goes back to everything I said I did. I honored it. Yeah. Like I remember being, I remember being in a room when my first artist is getting signed. And I remember the guy who I did the deal with was telling everybody he did everything I did. Mm. Like he was in the room like, I found the producers, I found the, I found this, I set him up in the studio, I flew them to New York, I did this. And mind you, I was driving my car to New York. He didn't do none of that. Oh, shit. But, hey, brother, shit, you are who you are. Yeah. Take the credit, I don't mind. It, it, I didn't even feel no way. Because mm -hmm. the way I looked at it was, he's telling them everything they need to hear mm -hmm. for them to be interested in cutting us a check. Mm -hmm. That's what I, it wasn't, I don't think he was trying to take my credit. I just think he needed to hype the, the situation yeah. up. So now they're like, oh wow. I don't think he, I don't think it would have been as effective. He would have been like, this young man did everything. <laughs> you know, I, I understand you. what he was doing. So, yeah. you know, he did that. We finally got the deal. And I remember when I called him, the guy who uh, I say his name is, is D. Angeletti, the mad rapper. I called him and I remember I was like, like I was like distraught because I'm like, bro, I did all this shit and I'm not gonna get nothing. Like I remember being like distraught and he was like, first of all, welcome to the music industry. So this is what God. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you half of my money. Ooh. And man, dog, he's such a real nigga for that. Because yeah. what happened was I wound up coming out with almost four times the amount of money. Mm -hmm. Like I was gonna get 10,000 off the deal yeah. if I got 20%. But because he did that, I wound up getting 37,000 off the deal. He gave me half his money, but he did it because I did all the work. Yeah. And he, and he was like, and he also knew I'm gonna still need you to do that shit the, again. The, the sh more work, <laughs> exactly. which I had no problem doing. Yeah. And you know, that artist a year later fell off and I found, I was ready friends with these guys from the Virgin Islands and they was like, help them. And I don't, can't even, I mean, maybe 200 million records later, I don't know how many uh, singles or albums or whatever we've done, but this many years later, I'm still in it, and none of those guys that shitting on me is in it. Come and on. we all still cool, but I really believe, that's why I said I know God is real, because I really believe that God gonna give you what you supposed to have, and he gonna give others what they're supposed to have based on their heart. Mm -hmm. And if you know this guy is doing everything for you and you're still wanting to shit on him, what does that say? What does that say to? Because I because when we all broke, we all praying people. I mean, yeah. when you broke, you ain't got number prayers. <laughs> am I right? Facts. So when you broke and you don't have number prayers, you praying to God like be a, like send me a blessing. Exactly. But then and and that and saying that you got to also be the blessing to people. So when it was time, so here I am doing what I'm supposed to do. Y'all turn to do right by me. Y'all didn't do right by me. Mm. And here I am. My mom ain't never. My mom ain't worked in ten years and don't never have to work again. And I don't know what their mom's doing. Come on. But I, that's on them. That's on their moves and their decisions. But I know what my mom is doing. My mom is living good, comfortable right now in a mansion. Mm -hmm. Driving a brand new Range Rover, I bought cash. Come on now. And to me, I didn't have the talent, but I know, I knew my heart was good and I knew I was just trying to help. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna take whatever was given to me. Not what I thought I deserved, because I didn't think I deserved anything. Because mm. in my mind, I'm thinking like, like Okay, imagine you went, imagine since you were a kid, you knew you wanted to be in the music industry. Yeah. And then you asked me to help you. Like, this is your dream. I'm the assist man on your dream. I'm throwing you the alley-oop so you yeah. can dunk. So I always looked at it like, I'm here to help other people get to their dreams. That Thanks. is my job. So in, in turn, those people will then help me get to my dream. And my only dream was to take care of my mom. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. So for me, it was like, I, it was a good deal to me. I, I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be, no, I just want to be able to make the money that come from what we're doing and take it home. It's which I did, which I still do to this day, 16 years later. What was that tipping point for you to when you realized that the money was good and it wasn't no turning back from that point going forward? 
about four years ago, uh, I never felt comfortable saying that I was in the music industry because I've seen so many people get sent home. Woo! Like, you gotta understand something. I remember the first mansion I went into was this guy who was in the game. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he's, I, I know he's not in the game anymore. Yeah. Or he's not in the game like he once was. Cause in this, the music business, let's, let's, let's talk honestly, the music business is an economics thing, right? It's, a, mm -hmm. it's its own ecosystem. So either you're making money, like we know where Beeha gets his money from, right? Exactly. So if Beeha stops doing this, mm -hmm. he's probably just gonna eat residuals off yeah. of this, but it's not gonna, but it's going it to slowly go down because he's not putting it in every day. So I've seen a lot of people get sent home. So for me, maybe about four years ago, five years ago, I say when I, yeah, about five years ago is when I was like, damn, I'm really in the music business. I can call it a career because five or six years ago was my 10th year in it, mm. making money. And I'm like, and I also figured out I was smart enough. Mm. Like it's man, it's so hard being from the hood with no confidence because you'll take whatever somebody gives you. I feel and you. And that was my story. But because people like me so much, they gave me more than I expected. Ooh. But once I started figuring out, I knew my shit. Mm -hmm. I started making more money because I started realizing what I brought to the table and what no one else brought to the table. Mm -hmm. So about five years ago, I was comfortable with saying, man, this is what I do. Like, damn, this is what I, like, you know how this shit is. You, yeah. you, you, start, you at the mercy <laughs> of one person deciding yeah. Be how we don't want you here no more. Come on. And now you now you on the outside, hopefully getting let back in by somebody else. Come That's on. why this is so dope. Cause you're actually saying, if you do send me home, I'm coming home to my shit. Exactly. And I'm okay with living off my shit. And that's a part of, you know, learning, being in the game long enough, understanding. And longevity. Yeah. And understanding that the system changes and you gotta change with it. But I really know what I'm doing and I really believe that if I was put in any other scenario that I will succeed. I think if you took, based on how I live my life, I think if you put me in the construction industry or if you put me in any other industry, I will succeed because I, I know what I know, I know what I don't know, I know I don't have a problem asking questions and I'm gonna show up every day with a smile on my face. Yeah. And I'm not gonna get mad at nobody for checking me, I'm not gonna get mad at nobody for correcting me. Mm -hmm. I don't mind that because I understand that somebody knows more. Yeah. Now the person that thinks he knows it all probably is the person that's gonna get sent home soon. Come on now. And I just never would allow myself to be the person that thinks he knows it all. As the CEO of Radar and then a label executive at a lot of different labels, I mean, talk to me about how important it was for you to make sure that Radar had it going on just as much as Ray Daniels, the label executive. Well, Ray Daniels, the label executive, only served. Okay, so this is why I went into a label. I went into a label because... I remember when Sylvia Rohn offered me my first position. I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember I had a number in my head. I was like, man, if she offered me this much money, I'm taking that shit. <laughs> and if she offered me less than that, I'm still taking it. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I went with you. you. I went you. The, money, the number I had in my head, she offered me double. My God. And I remember, but you know where that comes from? What she offered me was what the going rate was. When you don't know, in your mind, you like, you're not best, you're not, most of us don't base things off of what we're worth. We base yeah. things off of what we need. Yeah. So a lot of us are like, man, you give me this much money a month, I'll be good. Yeah. Not realizing that you might be worth more. And mind you, it took me 10 years to learn that. So I'm not even punishing anybody for yeah. that. I'm just saying, I took what they gave me. Exactly. But I only want to go inside because I looked at myself like a bank. I mean, I looked at myself like, a uh, 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 a seller to a bank, right? Mm -hmm. And I went inside because I wanted to know what the bank thought. Mm. Because how many people you see say, you know, I got the I got the next Beyonce, and it's like, well, damn, what what was it about Beyonce? Mm -hmm. You know, you because because like I said, I always knew I didn't know much. Mm -hmm. So if somebody told me I got the next Usher, how can I say you have the next Usher unless I go to the person, work for the person who had the real Usher? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how I looked at it. So I wanted to work for L.A. Reid. Yeah. Because I wanted to learn, why'd you sign TLC? Why'd you sign Usher? Why'd you sign this guy? Mm -hmm. Like, why'd you sign Outkast? Mm -hmm. Goody Mob. He, he, and mind you, he told me everything. Like, he literally was like, oh, this is why I signed him. This is why I signed, oh, this is why I signed. Uh, I remember I was trying to get a girl group signed. And 
LA was like, they not it. Mm. And I was like, what? And I was like, but TLC, da da da. He said, don't you ever say nothing about TLC. <laughs> no, no, mind you, he, he checked me, but it was dope because I, like I said, I don't mind. Like, I'm only speaking from a standpoint of somebody who don't know. Yeah. Like, once you know of you fuck up, you just a loser. Yeah. But w- when you don't know, people give you a pass. Like, if, yeah. you feel me? So I was I'm like, man, you. but TLC, da da. He was like, don't you ever say about TLC. And I said, what was it so dope about him besides they were beautiful girls and that you knew you could make the records? And he was like, have you ever heard a voice like T-Boss? Ooh. Ah. He said, me neither. And that's why it works because she had that ill voice that you had that energy from left eye and you had chili that came in with that smoothness and it was like damn yeah he codified it for me Mm -hmm. and a lot of the times in black business we don't codify things you know what i'm saying and one thing la did was he codified the industry for me he helped me understand why you don't have the next usher like how how is he the next usher how does he Mm -hmm. oh he's 21. okay cool well usher was on 8702 by the time he was 21. Mm. Usher was getting Usher was out here performing for young girls when he was 13. Yeah. So if he's going to be the next Usher, he got to start when he's 14, 15. Mm. Who was the only person that actually did that and became the next Usher? Chris Brown. Thanks. How old was he when he got signed? 15. So you start understanding. Mm-hmm. See, so I I only work one on the inside to learn how the the buyer thought because mm-hmm. in my mind, if I know what the buyer thought, I can help my people by giving them the information, and two, I can sell to the buyer. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even know I, being a label exec was something that I was gonna be doing, shit, uh, 10 years later. I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. I, I always went and worked for people who I knew. Like, mm-hmm. that was like, Ray, we need you. And I'm like, honored, like, you need me? Hell yeah, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Cause I didn't think that, I didn't really know the value of what I did. So now I do, and I'm still humble in it because I know that part of the quality that made me great was my humbleness in it from the jump. So if I lose that, I lost myself and I lost everything going on. Evaluating yourself though, Ray, coming from the hood and not really having a point of reference on to know exactly what your value was, how did you come to that conclusion of, this is the value of Ray Daniels, this is the value of Radar, this is the value of this job and this service? I'm still coming to the conclusion. Okay. I'm not gonna even act like I have it all together. I'm still coming to the conclusion, but what I had to learn, when you from the ghetto, okay, this is a secret, right? I don't, I hope, if it's that, if you're a black person and you ain't got no money, if mm-hmm. you remember one thing, remember this, what I said. The ghetto influences the entire world. Thanks. It's hard to realize your influence when you broke, though. Mm. So it's hard for you to realize your influence you. when you broke. So it's hard for you to understand your value when they're just taking it from the few and the proud who get mm. out of it. Yeah. Right? But the ghetto is where we come from. N- nobody tells the kid that he could dance that there's a million white kids on TikTok that would love these moves if you just monetize yourself. <laughs> Woo. Or Beehive, you seem to have great conversations. Yeah. Why don't you put a camera in front of you and a couple <laughs> of mics and monetize yourself? You can exactly. live off that. You'd be like, I could live off that? So you My don't God. know your value when you're in the ghetto. Like, and the thing about us is that, the thing that I understand is that our currency in the black community has always been cool and athletics, Mm. right? It's just just to be honest with you, I don't care what table you sit at, if there's a black man at the table, that table feels a little cooler. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you ain't last. It's just, that, but that's our currency. It's just what we bring to the table. Like, be high. You're supposed to know what the streets want. Yeah. That's what makes you cool. Yeah. You're supposed to know what's happening in the streets. Yeah. That's what makes you cool. And our, our currency is cool. So when you start thinking to yourself that they're trying to sell, and that's why I said I feel like I can work in any industry. Mm-hmm. Because y'all trying to sell to this mass audience of things that we do with nothing every day. Yeah. So not only am I going to help you guys sell, I'm going to help them get paid and see their value. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So for me, it's like once I understood that as long as they're aiming at the hip hop culture, which is not just black people at at anymore, Mm -hmm. which, you know, once they aim at the hip hop culture, you start realizing our power. It's like, bro, I don't give a damn if you run it for the president of the United States. You're trying to figure out how do I get young black people to come vote? Mm -hmm. I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if you're saying I'm opening a new restaurant. Who? What's your demo? 
okay, cool. Do you realize that wherever black people show up is cool? Come on. Then you start realizing because at the end of the day, outside of a certain industry, most industries is based on cool. Right, like if, if you most industries are based on cool. So my mind is like, if it's the cool restaurant, if it's the cool hotel, mm -hmm. if it's the whatever it is, it's still based on a certain caliber of people showing up there. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those people, and I understand it from every level because I was once one of those poor people, and I'm no longer one of those poor people. Mm -hmm. So I understand it on every level. Come on. So for me, it's like once you start realizing your power, it becomes it becomes. An amazing feeling because now, then you realize you're no longer at the mercy of another culture. You're at the mercy of your own. As long as you stay true to your own, you can't lose. When you came to my class, Ray, you said something that almost brought a tear to a gangster's eye when I was back there watching you speak to the students. At that time, I was 36. Mm -hmm. I remember. And you was talking about when you turned 36, 36 and what it was about that number that something clicked for you. Yeah. Can you hit that again for those that well, don't well, know well, one that well, witness it? Well, it goes back to the 10 year thing. Um, in order to be in order to be a professional at anything, you need to put in at least 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. It usually takes 10 years to put in 10,000 hours. Uh, I. I was in the music industry. I really got in when I was around, when I was 25. Mm -hmm. So 25 to 35, I was just really putting hours surviving. Yes. But in those hours I learned, I, I learned lessons. Um, bro, I could tell you one of the most important lessons after this, but I learned lessons and the thing that, when you get to a certain point, like you are a teacher. Yeah. I'm a coach and a teacher too. Mm -hmm. You figured out I can teach one classroom, I could teach the world. Facts. You do both, by the way. Yeah. That's what makes it even doper. Because exactly. I'm going to talk to y'all, but I'm going to do the micro and the macro. Um, so for me, I think when I got to the age of 36, I started hanging around other people who let me realize. And I, this, is, this, is, this is a key. I always tell people, if you got if your problems are big to you, take them to, take them to somebody who they're small to. Mm. Like, big, so... When I got around that age, I start, so I started hanging around around 34, 35, 36, 34 really, I started hanging around uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Luke, and uh, who's almost a billionaire. And mm. when you start looking at how he looked at my problems, it made you really realize, this ain't shit. <laughs> Cause they're always gonna be they're gonna be problems for anybody you have. Some people are worried about keeping the lights on in their house. Yeah. Some people are worried about keeping the lights on in their office. If they yeah. worry about keeping the lights on in their office, more than likely the house is okay. Yeah. Some people worry about keeping the lights on in them buildings. Yeah. It's just how you see the world, right? Yeah. So for me, that was around the age where I started understanding. I started realizing that my problems are only big to me because I'm hanging around small-minded people. Mm. I need to be around big big minded people. I need to be around people who, that's like if somebody came to me and said, hey Ray, I'm, my trouble is I can't find such and such. I'm like, that's all you need? Yeah. Oh man, I'll make a phone call, hey. And all of a sudden it goes away. Mm -hmm. Hang around people who see your big problems and small problems. Mm -hmm. But then when you hang around those people, help them solve their problems. Facts. And they can't wait to help you solve yours. Mm -hmm. So to get back to it, I think I was on my 10,000 hours. I did, and I think that I just figured out that I belonged. And once I figured that out, I felt safe in it. Mm. It's hard to feel safe in this business. You know that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, dog, I didn't every, feel every, safe until like, I started my own. Andre 3000 said it the best. If you don't move your feet, then I don't eat. You Come know? On. And like, your business is to serve. One, and I think I also figured out a lot. I, I smartened up. Like, I wanted to learn first how to make hit records. That's all I cared about. How'd you like I said when I was with LA, I wasn't asking about business. I was asking about music. I was asking about choices like yeah. like Sylvia, why did you pick Buster Rhymes? Mm. And she was like, and then, you know, LA, why'd you sign Travis Scott? And he tell you like this why. And you start realizing, mm. And then once I started elevating around 2015, is when we talked to your class, it started hitting me. Mm -hmm. I need to understand the business because cool is going, I mean, you know, you could always be cool as an older black man. Mm -hmm. I mean, but Russell Simmons is nowhere near as cool today as he was 30 years ago when he was a CEO of Def Jam. It's yeah. just, you elevate, you, you got kids, you start yeah. realizing what's important, you know, you become a daddy, that becomes more important than anything else. Yeah. You know, so once you start realizing, okay, cool, I know it's cool, and I'm always stay tapped into that. I'm always know what to wear, I'm always know the chain, I'm always know the right watch, mm -hmm. but I wanted to know the business. 
and I started feeling more safer that because I started understanding the economics of mm -hmm. the business. And I'm learning every I'm day. Like, everything I learn, I take it and teach once you start understanding the problems you're solving, mm -hmm. bro, you can't lose. Billboard had to quote you on the whole letter that you put out mm -hmm. as a black executive. What has that been like for you being a black executive trying to explain people, explain to people the culture and how to navigate through it? You know, I don't, I don't, I never looked at what I said as controversial. I, I looked at what I said as enlightening because I never said my opinion. I never, like one thing you'll learn about me is that I'm never gonna speak to you subjectively. Mm -hmm. I'm always gonna speak to you objectively. I'm always gonna give it to you from a standpoint where you understand, like it's like B.I. It might take me 10 hours to make take a sh 10 minutes to take a shower, but B.I. is like, well it takes me 15. Why? I have dreads. Mm -hmm. Oh damn, I never thought about that. Yeah. How long does it take to take care of that? Now you're enlightening me. You're yeah. not basically making me feel like shit because I don't have dreads, exactly. I have dreads and you don't. So the letter to me was that. It was like, how can I educate my peers on the black experience without uh without anonymously because i want i didn't it wasn't a, like I, it wasn't about ray mm -hmm. um ray has built his own and i i've established myself and i feel like i i don't you i don't you never know what you mean to the world until you step out and a mm -hmm. lot of us kind of like so busy working that we don't understand the importance of ourselves to the mm -hmm. world and i don't think i have figured that out yet being honest mm -hmm. you know but you know for me just just understanding, man. Just, just. I wanted to help them understand who we were, what we're told. I didn't talk to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. I just gave my experience. Mm -hmm. But the black experience in America is usually the same for all of us. Mm -hmm. Some of us, some of us is worse for. You Thanks. know, some of us is a little bit better for. But as long as you're not the majority, you're always at the, in your head. You're always at the mercy of the majority. Mm -hmm. When you're the minority, you're always at the mercy of a majority. So I just wanted them to see, like, look, we're told we're gonna make half as much. We don't, every black person that we see at the top answers to another white person. Mm -hmm. That is just, it's only a couple pe black people that can cut checks that didn't get permission. And I just wanted them to see in the middle of asking us, you're our brothers. It's like, okay, cool. I can't completely be your brother until you know my experience. Yeah. And I, it was just really trying to teach you guys, teach the other side my experience. And when I came out on it, I feel like it became more effective because I am one of the guys that I ain't stole from nobody. Mm -hmm. I ain't cheated nobody. I ain't, I ain't never double dip. I did the honorable thing every time. And it made, and when I came out on it, I had bigger execs who I admired call me like, I'm glad it was you mm -hmm. because it's hard to receive uh, a, a sad story, if you will, from from anonymous. Cause it's like, what if you are the victim type? Yeah. And everybody knows that, that one thing I'm not is the victim. Like yeah. I'm not the victim of my, I'm not the victim of my circumstances. I'm the results of I'm, my circumstances are results of who I am. Thanks. So when I stood on it, it made more sense to a lot of people. But I mean, it's a work in progress, bro. Like you know, we are making more money now mm -hmm. uh, because. Streaming, all streaming really did was monetize the mixtape culture that we all survived in. Come on now. So when people are like amazed at how black people are like running streaming, I'm like, nigga, we was <laughs> we've been y'all forgetting. Lil Wayne was putting out mixtapes for free and drama, DJ and then was putting drama. out mixtapes for free. Come on, and 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 hoping that the store gave him a dollar two on it. Like we are the we are the kings of making it work with no options. Exactly, because we are from the ghetto. That's right. It goes back to that whole thing. The ghetto doesn't realize we don't realize our value Thanks. because it's only a few people get up and leave. But when you realize that. The, we are the ones that make it, you'll understand your power. Mm -hmm. And and my goal is to make us see that and hopefully help a lot of us get there. Answer me this though, Ray, because one thing about you that I've always admired and seen was your passion for the game. Yes. I've never seen you at a point to where you was like, fuck this shit, I quit, y'all can have it. What is it in you that keeps you passionate and motivated about what it is that you do? Because plenty of times I've been like, you know what, y'all can have this shit. And when you and when you say that, it's usually behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talking to me then? Come on. Uh, now I want to quit twice a week, at least. I want to quit twice a week. I feel defeated twice a week. Twice a week. I right. feel defeated twice a week. And the other brother, just know this: what we doing is we're breaking generational curses, mm -hmm. like 
I, sometimes I want to tell my white friends, I'm like, just the fact that you had a dad in the house yeah. gave you 75% chance better than it gave me to make it. You know, uh, just because you had a mother that said, oh, you want to do this, or oh, you should do this, or oh, you should do that, it gave you an advantage that it didn't give us. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to break generational curses. I'm also trying to help others break generational curses, but I'm also trying to find a way to take my value, take my, my what I'm doing higher. It's just a lot, man. It's like some days you just feel like quitting. Like there's not a room that I go into where I'm not challenged to think. Mm -hmm. And that's really frustrating. For, like it's like it's frustrating sometimes I feel like a lawyer like sometimes I feel like I gotta think for lawyers I'm on the phone with like why don't we try this because in their mind they we're, we're all bro when I tell you say if I say to Beehive right now I'm gonna be your partner that don't mean I'm gonna be your partner that don't mean like alright man that means whatever you have on you I just took half of it off Come on, I take now. it that serious so when you take when you when you give that kind of commitment to people you're gonna always want to quit because if you see somebody else not giving that kind of commitment to themselves exactly it's like damn bro like damn bro we finally it's like this is this is the best way to describe it today i manage beehive and i manage my brother right here ej the dj EJ the dj right i manage beehive to manage ej i just closed the deal for beehive matter of fact hold up i've been managing ej for a year now uh-huh i already made ej a six-figure check ej's good now i got beehive I'm managing Beehive now. I'm mm -hmm. about to put a check in Beehive hand. The day I put the check in Beehive hand, and Beehive's like, Ray, thank you for everything you did. EJ is coming up like, my money's low now. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, bro, I, that's my life. My yeah. life is, is, trying to, is trying to monetize imperfect human beings who I can't manage 24-7. Yeah. It's really hard. It's like, it's really difficult, bro. And, you know, the... I always say I'm managing something that could talk back. I'm managing something that could feel back. I'm managing something. I'm developing something that might get a girlfriend today who might have another agenda that I'm mm. also fighting against. Shit. And at that point, you sometimes you just want to quit. Yep. So twice a week, Ray Daniels is like, I can't do this shit. How does Ray get his head back in the game, though? Then I, then I realize, oh, well, what the hell else you going to do? <laughs> and and then I, I think about the people that's before me and what they dealt with. Yeah. And then you it makes you realize, you know, sometimes I got to, I think sometimes I got to tap into what I built over the years yeah. and realize I've amassed a lot. Facts. Like, damn, be high. Like, I made EJ 150000 over the last six months of his money gone, but I didn't blow my money. Yeah. So you know what I'm about to go do? I'm about to go enjoy my fucking money. Exactly. Some days I might just go, and, honestly, I might just go enjoy my money. I might go enjoy what I built. I might go just indulge a little and and have a good time, you know? Sometimes I go take a nap. I don't know, bro. I'm going to find, because I know that I cannot quit. And I know that I don't, like I said, it goes back to that. My father's dead. Like, like dog, who do you call yeah. When you're trying to figure out what's, like, how do you now? 37. 37. Okay, cool. So wh who do you call once you pass the plateau of where your family set for you? Like, okay, they said. Jesus. Exactly. God, then, the talking, creator. Exactly. And then, but then when you realize you're dealing in the devil's playground a lot of times. Like who thinks about the long, who thinks about how long it's gonna, like who, nobody told me I was gonna be in the music business 16 years. And I hate to cut you off, Go ahead. but what you said earlier when you were like, when I'm in my car, I'm listening to podcasts yeah. and I'm listening yeah. to audio books. Yes. That's how I get the information. That's, brother, okay, so let me tell me. Yeah. I'm gonna, that's why it's no excuses. I'm gonna listen to someone who is who has been through more than me, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna listen to their story because yep. then they're giving you their 40 year story yep. in a three hour book. Yeah. Okay, cool. I could do that. So now you realize this ain't nothing. Then I start writing things. I might write something down. Then I might go look at something I wrote myself two and a half years ago. Like damn. And I was like, this is the hardest day of your life. How are you gonna get through this? And I'm like, damn, you got through it. Yep. So sometimes you gotta realize that life ain't perfect. No script is perfect, and shit is gonna happen. And you got to, I think where I'm at now in life is I'm trying to learn how to smile through that shit. Mm -hmm. Because 
you're not going to wake up and everything's going to be right. Yeah. You know, all you can really do is hope. Like I said, it goes back to what I said when I started the music industry. All you can do is hope to honor your position, honor your relationships, honor the people in your life the best way you know how. Because sometimes that might not be perfect. Yep. You know, like sometimes that might not be perfect. Or sometimes they might think you're a bad person and you're like, nah, I'm just tired of being a good person to you. Yeah. You know, real talk. <laughs> Come like, on now. Like I, was, I was on the phone with a friend of mine today who owes me all types of money, calls me for money all the time. And today he called me and he was like, man, how you doing? And I was like, I'm good, man. He was like, I just want to check on you, man. I was like, you should do this more. Because if you did this more, I probably wouldn't mind giving you money. Come on. And I was like, and I referenced the Godfather. I'm like, he said, the Godfather, by the way, if you, you got to watch the Godfather for the, all the life lessons because it starts off with a guy at his wedding, his daughter's yeah. wedding, the Godfather at his daughter's wedding, and the guy saying, I need help. And he's saying to him, I'm not your, don't call me your friend. Yeah. I'm not your friend. Friends check on each other. Friends talk to each other. Mm -hmm. You don't ask me how my kids are doing. You don't come check on me. You don't yeah. come do that to me. And that's what a friend would do. You come to me and ask me for something, and then you run away from me because you're really afraid of me. Yeah. You might be, whatever reason is, you're, you you fear me. And that's why I told my friend today, I'm like, bro, I'm your friend since we was kids. Yeah. Bro, I don't, I'm cool. I don't, the money you ask me for is not major to me. Yeah. But it's, when the last time you brought your kids over there to play with mine? Yeah. Like, when the last time you brought your kids? Oh, yeah, you're right. I know I'm right. Like, yeah. I'm not, I'm fucking human. I'm not a bank. Okay then, Ray, what about success and what that does to you and how that isolates you and changes everybody's perspective and opinion of you even though you ain't changed, you just grew in your career? I'm glad you asked that. Great fucking question. It goes back to the Godfather. In our community, unfortunately, the Godfather, they have, they have a ranking and an understanding in Italian families. Like, granddaddy is granddaddy no matter how much money you got. Come on. You could be the billionaire, but that's still granddad. That's right. Mind you, I try to live by that. Like, I agree. I got uncle, I'm richer than all my uncles. And I, I, they call me for money, and I don't care because they're my yeah. uncles, but I still call them for advice. Exactly. I just called an uncle yesterday, like, Unc Uncle Chucky, am I tripping? Exactly. But, you know, in our community, we look at that as ass kissing, and that bothers me mm -hmm. because if I'm a poor, if I'm fucked up, I don't have nothing. Yeah. The first successful person that I ever encountered Real talk, first person that I, I met that I knew was a millionaire mm. that I was interacting with, if that man would have told me, yo, jump off this right now, you could, I, I, mean, you're gonna be, I would have did it. Yeah. I didn't look at it like I'm kissing his ass. I looked at it like, this man knows more than me and you need to shut the fuck up. And that's what we don't have in our community. <laughs> of course. We don't have that thought process. Yeah. He knows more, so you should shut the fuck up and listen to him. Yeah. And that's what, that's what success is like. Now, 16 years in, you would think I know. Yeah. 16 years in, you would think, man, this is... You should talk to him, but you still got people who are like, ah, oh, he lucky. Yeah. I'm, unfortunately, I just want to tell you about, you don't get lucky for 16 years. Come on. You don't, I mean, even if, even, if you, even if you're on a basketball team and you're not, you're only averaging two points a game, I guarantee you that person is the heart and soul of the damn um, the locker room when they're not on the court. Yeah. I guarantee that person is the person that's like, LeBron, you could do it. I guarantee that person does something. Mm -hmm. You have to bring something to the table. And success teaches you that. Because everybody can't go. Because if everybody could go, then there would be the 97% would be rich and the other 3% would be poor. <laughs> so everybody can't go. So the only people who can go are the people who have made their mind up that this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to listen. And for me, success breeds isolation because people don't want to hear. Like I posted on Instagram today, like, hey, that the truth? Mm -hmm. I mean, I ain't never got, nobody ever got mad at me for telling a lie about themselves. Mm -mm. Like, be how you white. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> be how you an asshole. What? <laughs> Truth only hurts you. So, for me, for me, in order to break curses, in order to change your life, you have to look at your unfortunate truths. Mm -hmm. Face them head on. Change them. Answer me this, Ray. When you speak of Instagram, you also do a lot of preaching on that thing as well. You said that all this again. Let's say teaching because, you know, people hate to be preached on. Facts. Preaching and teaching in this thing. So educating folks on the music industry and you talking about artists getting too much money too fast with little work yes. initiated to get it there. What are your thoughts on that again? Man, this dude is asking some amazing questions. It's like <laughs> it's like Barbara Walters and this <laughs> shit. Um, okay, so this is the problem. In order to be in order to be great, mm -hmm. right, you have to chase greatness. 
Facts. Say if you say to yourself, I want to be the next uh, Barbara Walters. I just said her name, yeah. right? You know, I want to be the next Barbara Walters. Like, what does that look like for you, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you're like, it looks like, it looks like I'm this, I'm this, I live like this. But let's say you just live like that off your YouTube page. Mm-hmm. What what do you what is less for you to push for? Mm. So the problem with the new music business is is that, and I say the good problem, is that there's so much money flowing that an artist with a gold single now is making millions of dollars. Mm. An artist with three gold singles is making millions of dollars. How are you gonna tell that artist there's another level to this? I've already made. <laughs> I already made the millions of dollars that I thought I would make being an artist. Mm-hmm. Like shit, I made it. Like, and and that's why I loved working for for La Reed because I watched how he moved the goalposts. Mm. I watched how he would say, "Okay, we just did an, a million albums. Yeah, how are we gonna get the two million next album? Not." Man, he did a million albums. Man, here's a big check. He gave you the big check. You know, yeah. that's good. Celebrate each other, but. Artists are not prone to work because they're making money already. So, bro, I, like, I came in this game working with artists who wanted Jay Z to say you're the best, or wanted somebody their idol to say you're the shit. Like, yeah. remember the stories about Chris Brown when he came up? They would be like, I, like Tina Davis tells me a story. She's like. Chris Brown, we was at a, a Grammy party, and Chris yeah. Brown had three parties to go to. It was like Kanye got a party, Usher got a party, somebody else. I can't remember. I'm, I, I just remember Kanye was one name and Usher was another name. Yeah. And she was like, where do you want to go? Because you're only 15 years old, and you can't stay out past this time. So you can't go to all three. And he was like, take me to Usher party. Why he want to go to Usher party? I want to battle him. <laughs> this is a story. If you ever looked this up, this is like a known story. Yeah. Like, that's why... 15, 16 years later, Chris Brown is still the fucking man. Facts. Because it has to be something in you outside of making money. Mm-hmm. And money is either going to make you lazy or it's going to make you hungrier. Mm-hmm. It does one of two things to you. Either makes you like, oh, shit, I can relax. Or it yeah. makes you say, damn, I want more. <laughs> you know? And I'm I think, you. And I think that the greatness code requires you to want more at all times. Mm-hmm. Like, Where's the next Beyonce? I mean, we should know it by now, cause, but I guarantee you the next Beyonce ain't working as hard as the current Beyonce, which My is God. impossible to do if you think about it, because it's like, how the hell are you going to catch her? You need to be, if she's doing eight hours, you need to be doing 16, because you're trying to catch her. And that's the world we live in. And why would you, who wants to work 16 hours when they got a million dollars in the bank and they can go spend that shit? I got another question, okay. Ray, because see, this goes back to what I was just talking to EJ before you got here, and we were talking about that work ethic and yeah. that hard work. Nobody knows how hard Beyonce works. All they see is Beyonce. Can you break down the real hard work behind the scenes that people have to put in to be Beyonce? I mean, it's simple. You have to work like nobody, like, you have to work every day like everybody's watching um you have to want the right results and it can never be enough like it's like it's like being an athlete like it's never enough like beyonce wants something bigger now that's why a lot of artists retire because it's like you get to a point it's like well damn where do i go from here yeah like, you know they might come back for once like jay-z he's an artist when he wants to be yeah because it's like what do jay-z do that he hasn't done he sold out stadiums arenas everything yeah um but it's about i mean dog this unfortunate part about my business is you don't know who someone is till you give him a check and will smith said it once will smith tells a story he says I got a thousand dollars for my advance. And all I remember when I got that thousand dollars, I said to myself, I'm never gonna fuck up a chance to get somebody to give me a thousand dollars to do this again. Mm -hmm. So whatever I gotta do to make sure people wanna continue to give me money, I'm gonna do it. That's right. That's a mentality. Like, you gotta, like, dog, you gotta put yourself in that ring every day. And the minute that I feel like I don't wanna be in the ring no more is the minute I'm gonna be done. Like, the minute that I'm not excited to get in the ring, Mm -hmm. I'm done because 
I, that's why I want to quit some days. Because yeah. it's like, I'm in a ring every day. And sometimes I feel like I'm working harder than the people who got less than me. Yeah. And I, and I want to quit. It's not because I don't want to do it. It's just yeah. because it's like, how the hell am I going to get somewhere if I got more than all of y'all and I'm not working on y'all? <laughs> At that point, you'd be like, there's no more me's around. But what keeps yeah. me going is looking for the next me. Because if I find them, I'm going to give them. That's the hard part. I'm gonna give them, but nobody gave me. That's what made me who I am. Uh, That's a trick. So when I find them, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach them how to be better than me. So I always tell my people, I'm like, how do you? I'm 28. Okay, cool. You learning what I learned at 36. Come on now. Let's apply it. You know what I mean? Because exactly. by the time you get 30, you should be a fucking monster. Beast. And that's what it's about. Yeah. So for me, it's about people just don't want it, man. Like. Oh, nobody wants it like that. Like they want it, but they don't know what little baby had to do. They don't yeah. know what 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 uh 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 P and coach had to do to get there. They don't know what yeah. they was dealing with. They don't know. You you want what they got, but exactly. if you really want what they got, you should be out there trying to get it with a yeah. smile on your face. Yeah. Simple. What do you think about people not really telling that other side of the game either? Because you just see it. You just see, but not many people actually break down the struggles and how many repetitions it takes to be Kobe Bryant. They just want to say, hey, God gave me this gift and uh, you can watch me do what I do. That's a, that's, a, that's a hard one. So let me take my responses to that, mm -hmm. honestly. Then they didn't go through it. Ooh. And, and, and Ooh. I Ooh. No, I'm just being I'm honest. With you. Let me tell you why I say that. Because nobody that went through the real struggle <laughs> is not gonna pay respect to it. Come on, they ain't gonna leave it out. They're not gonna leave it out. Like so, so don't get me wrong, you probably went through the grind. Yeah. But you didn't go through the hell. The, the hell. Somebody was somebody was taking all those bricks from hitting on their head, hitting on their head, and protecting you My as God. an artist because you gotta pay respect to it. Like yeah. You gotta pay risk. You you don't get to the other side and not look back and be like, "Woo, damn!" Yeah, and not say, even if you say, "I don't want to be there," <laughs> even if it's like, "Dog, this is this." It, it goes back to what I said. I'm gonna say something about artists. Artists, when they first come out, they rap about what they inspire to be, mm -hmm. and then once they get there, they rap about who they once was, mm. and then once they get past that, they rap about where they are. I always say it's hard to talk about classic albums now because nobody is trying, nobody is saying 444 album. What was that? Okay, I woke up at this time and realized that I was tripping and I needed to make changes. Mm -hmm. Jay-Z took you the way he was. Mm -hmm. Every album is a time capsule of where he was in time. Yeah, That's why he said, niggas want my old shit, buy my old albums. Yeah, Niggas stuck with stupid. I gave y'all the blueprint. I like telling you, like, I'm not there no more. Like, yeah. this is where I'm at. And to me, uh, 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 with this, that's how you could tell who's really going through something because you hear it in their music. That's mm -hmm. why I, I think so many people connect to Lil Baby because yeah. he's telling you, I told my niggas, y'all can come get money with me or y'all can stay in the streets. Exactly. He's telling you where he is. And to me, that's what a true artist does. They tell you where they are. And I think that's true for business people, I think that's true for everyone. Like, you can never lose by telling your truth. So you asking why they don't tell their truth is because it's not their truth. Somebody gave them a check and they were talented and y usually you could tell because of how how they treat their money. You could, t you could just tell <laughs> how they treat their money. Like, dog, I was, no lie, no bullshit. True story. This morning, I, I was getting in my car. Mind you, all my cars are paid off. I'm good. And I seen a quarter on the ground behind my car. No no <laughs> lie. I swear to God. I swear. To, hold on. Let me see if it's in my pocket. I, I might I, I might have picked it up and put it in my car, but I just yeah. picked it up. And, and I remember saying to myself, the minute that I look at money and say, I don't need that or I can yeah. walk over it is the minute that I'm telling the world, don't send blessings my way. Yeah. Because if you can't take the smallest blessing, you ain't going to take the biggest. Facts. Feel me? So I'm I saw the quarter and I just picked it up and I just I, I think I just do it threw it in my um my car thing. But yep. in my mind it was like I just can't imagine it being on the floor in my house. Exactly. Because I don't because in my world, that's not showing respect to who I once was. Cause mm -hmm. I remember at one point in my life having three or four dollars was how I survived. Yeah. 
So that quarter is a percentage of what it took for me to survive at one point. So now I'm like, oh, fuck that quarter. It's just nothing to me. Mm-hmm. Dog, you can't burn money. You can't, dog, you can, I, I, I can't imagine myself going into the club and throwing it in the air. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I work too hard for it, and I know too many people that need it. Yeah. It's just me being honest. Like, now, don't get me wrong. If you are the type of person that that is your brand, and, like, I get that. But mm-hmm. Ray Daniels, that's not my brand. That's mm-hmm. not who I am. I remember being in a strip club with a nigga who had money, and I'll never forget that shit. I love going with him because he would give me hundreds to throw to the girls, and I would put that shit in my fucking pocket. <laughs> I needed that shit. I'm not even lying to you. That was like groceries for the, for yeah. the, for the, for the two or three weeks for me. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I'm not, and I'm, I, I threw some of it, but I pocketed most of it because I needed it. <laughs> but, I, but that's what I'm saying. I, I'm true. I'm the hero to my 16 year old self. I'm the I'm the person that who I was when I was 16 who I was looking for. I am that person to. Yeah. I'm the, and I'm also true. I'm also like I got here but it wasn't easy. So I'm not going to act like it was. Yeah. I'm not going to disrespect it. I'm gonna always respect it and I'm gonna always honor it and that's just where I'm at with it. And like I said, I mean, and for me I just I'm just different, but I just I just feel like there's certain things people do that lets you know, oh, he's been through some shit. Mm-hmm. Or certain things people move, it's like, how could you be a bad person? Mm-hmm. Somebody gave it to you. Come Somebody on. Somebody gave it to you. That's why you're that's why you're a bad person. Somebody gave it to you. Cause even if you you work if you worked for it, you still remember how it was. People remember who shitted on them when they were down. Exactly. So you don't want to shit on nobody because you remember being shitted on unless on. you weren't. I'm with you. Unless, you know, unless somebody shit on you through another person, or another yeah. person came and said, yo, Beehive, he wasn't really interested. Oh, yeah. Okay, fuck him. Exactly. But you didn't really get shit at all. Yeah. You know, you you didn't you didn't lose anything but time. Yeah. Some people lose time, money, family, relationships, lives exactly. to be here. It's just different. Songwriters not getting paid like producers and artists. What are your thoughts on that, Ray? I think it's the biggest, to me, I think it's one of the biggest discrepancies in the music business. Um, and, and and because when you understand the economics of it, as a writer, you write a song, you write four songs, and the guy sent the beat, and I don't give a fuck if you did the beat, EJ gave you somebody, some, no, you didn't do the beat, you say you're the producer, EJ didn't do the beat, he said you producer, and another guy gave him the beat, all three of those guys are gonna get paid. My God. As a writer, you wrote the song, and you're not getting paid. Meanwhile, and mind you, it's not really a, a, a big thing to change. It's just, bro, I know some great songwriters who are like broke as fuck. And I know some terrible producers who are like. Rich as fuck. Not even rich, but, but doing better than the songwriters. Because, you know, as a songwriter, you only get your writer and publisher share, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think they should get paid. I think the label that decides to change that is going to be the label that gets the best. The best writers. The, the right Because at the end of the day, producers are sought after. Producers seek artists, mm-hmm. right? Look at it, let's look at this ecosystem. Producers seek artists. Mm-hmm. Most artists write for themselves. Yeah. You know, most rappers write for themselves. But you get to a place where you want bigger records, better records. At that point, they need the writer. Mm-hmm. Pay them. The producer get paid. Pay them. I'm not saying get as much as the producer. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying everybody walk away with money. Yeah. Everybody in the room made money except for the person that wrote the words that the worlds are going to sing. Mm-hmm. Something needs to be changed about that. And it's, and it's only because back in the day, producers, so you wrote a Luther Vandross song. You hired the producer to produce it for you. So he, he got raw points and he got money. You own the copyright. Mm-hmm. So you own 100% of the song. He didn't get no publishing, but now they, you get publishing. So if you're getting publishing, everybody should get points. I think everybody could contribute to the record should get paid. I think it's only right. And I think when you have, and I think another thing that happened to the business was songwriters realized how much money wasn't in it for them that they started saying, I'm gonna put out songs on myself. Mm. And that's now we losing the superstar because now the songwriter is like, I'm not giving a record to the superstar. <laughs> so the producer can get paid $70,000 and the superstar can go sing my song for the rest of his life. And I, and I got to wait. No. And then the superstar is going to want publishing on the song. Yep. Rightfully so. No. So they was like, I'm putting this shit out myself. And I think that that's what happened to the business. I think paying songwriters will change the ecosystem. And my only goal is to leave this shit like with dear white executives and that songwriter uh, thing. Uh, post. My only job goal is to leave the business better than it was when I came in it. Because mm-hmm. like I said, I'm the hero to my 16-year-old self because I might not meet him, but 
when he does get there, economically, he's going to be better off because of the game. To me, it's just only fair. Pay the writers. What is it like for you being a label exec, though? Because you have one of those, a lot of people in general, they get into the music industry, and they might not want to be artists, writers, or producers. They want to be Ray Daniels. What is it like being Ray Daniels, and what is a life, a day in the life of Ray Daniels entail? Well, the new the new music exec is a little different than the old one because mm -hmm. 15 years ago you had to find talent, uh, sign them, and with the hopes of their them being stars. Uh, now, you know, it's so much data out there that we can kind of predict mm. where something is going to go, which then gives us more intel. But then it, it takes the gut thing away in a lot of ways, where it's mm. like you know, like, and 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 rightfully so because. Now, like I said, go, when you had to press up 100,000 albums, that was money. Yeah. Now, if you're an artist, let's say if you're a rapper and you're 21 and you ain't putting no music out, mm -hmm. you don't have no followers, that's <laughs> shit that, that don't cost nothing. Come on. So, my, so in our world, we live in, it's like, bro, we, you need to show us that you have the habits to do the job so when we come on, all we doing is enhancing. Mm -hmm. So... You know, to people that want to be Ray Daniels, is I love it. But you know, the the new thing is is finding th the talent has to do the work, and you have to find the right talent, and hopefully, y'all make some fucking magic, and hopefully, but it's not like it used to be. It's not like we got too much information. Everybody, it's too much access. Where there was one bonfire, mm -hmm. and everybody, and once you got close to that fire, you was in the game. Yeah. Now that that hundreds burning everywhere. My you know, God. and that's the new game. It's, it, it was only three or four ways to get on back then. Radio, if you got a song on the radio, you was guaranteed to get a deal. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you sold albums, mm -hmm. you know, independently. Or, you know, I mean, MTV, BET, I mean, what outlets were there? Yeah. Now they're what, 70 DSPs? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you, shit, your audience might be on Pandora. Yeah. Your audience might be on 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 SoundCloud. Uh, SoundCloud. Your yeah. audience might be on Amazon Music, yeah. it might be on Spotify, it might be on Apple. Yeah. It, and and you should know that. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't at this point, what the hell do you want us to do? Yeah. Like think about that for a second. Like if you can't tell me this is where my audience lives and this is what they like, that means I have to go from zero to a hundred, and it's also and it's also something that you gotta acknowledge. That means I also have to look past the people who are figuring that out. Yeah. So it's not like nobody's figuring it out, and I'm like, "Hey, what do you want me to do?" <laughs> Just being honest. Yeah. You have to you have to understand that part. There are too many ways to put out music, and you have to understand that you might not be doing nothing, and you might be frustrated because nobody's coming for you. But we're going for the people who are trying. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are getting the opportunities. Don't hurt to try. Don't hurt to try. So now, as a label exec, when you see these artists out here with these different bonfires that are already monetized, how do you still encourage them to come in and sign with labels now in this day and age where if these folks are independent, they can make some money. They, more than likely, they're going to know they value by the time you get to them if they have that, that, taken the that, appropriate that's steps. That's true, and, and that's true, and... That that I'm not gonna even say that that is the challenge. Mm. I mean, I think that everybody wants to. I think I think everybody wants help. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care. I, I don't care who you are. It's hard. To, like, bro, if you want to sleep at night, yeah. And if you want to have a team that sleeps at night, help is gonna. You want help. Nobody. I, I haven't encountered anybody who didn't want to do a deal. Okay. They might have said, I don't want to deal, deal do a deal now. Mm -hmm. They might say, I'm figuring things out. Let me come to you. Let, let's talk about it when I'm ready. But I, I don't think no one not wants to do a deal. I think everybody wants to be in business with a company who can help enhance mm -hmm. globally what they're doing. I mean, that's another thing. You know, it's the difference between being a superstar and a global superstar. Thanks. And, in, and a global superstar, you have to have... 200, 150 to 200 people working on your behalf across the world. And that's just the truth, you know? So there's, there's a difference in that, but you know, it's not really hard. You know, mm -hmm. I think everybody, I think everybody understands. And I think when you start realizing how much money it costs you, you like, man, somebody wanna come help me with this shit? <laughs> Break down them numbers. How much money is it costing? Well, it depends, bro. Okay, I have an independent artist signed to me. Mm -hmm. I have artists, um, and you talking about we have a song we like, we gotta shoot a video. I'm paying 10,000 for the video. I'm tr 
paying for the artist to be here. I'm paying for the studio time. I'm easily spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my artists before I even got a dollar back. And most mm. of them, you don't get your money back. Most of them, you don't. So if somebody came and said, Ray, we want to fund that, shit, okay. <laughs> Come on with it. I'm cool with that. I'm, and yeah. I think everybody looks at it like that. Like, mm. dog, like, it's... The, the, the way the rich have always gotten rich was other people's money. Mm -hmm. I would definitely say use someone else to help you. So now I got a two-part question. Okay. As an independent CEO, what is it that makes an artist attractive to you? And then as a label exec, what is it that makes an artist attractive to you? That's a damn good question. You you have to assess where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I have this group signed to me. Uh, they had nothing going on. They just was talent. I knew it was going to take two years to develop them. So at that moment, I commit two years to developing them. I put- My God, right? Because they don't have songs out, they don't even have a name yet. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, you're gonna put music out in the next six months, but yeah. I mean, you if I plan for six months, yeah. and that shit don't work, we fucked. <laughs> you, when you running a business, you know how this is, yeah. you got your new business, you like, hold on, I, I need some for the next three months, but these people need me to commit for the next two years. Exactly. You gotta make those decisions, so it's, it's a lot like that. So it's really just deciding. And then some people, you realize they don't need your help like that. It just yeah. depends. But it does give me a vantage point because I can then assess people and say, hey, this is what I think you're missing and this is what I think you're not missing. I think it's time for you to do this. Or you're great at that. Some some labels are good at like marketing and they need A&R. Some, it's just help. Some labels are good at A&R and they need marketing. It's just really understanding what assessing a, a artist like you would assess a company and saying, mm -hmm. this is what I think we need around here to make things better. Yeah. Looking at an artist out here though, Ray, as an exec, what is it that that artist need to have going on if they're trying to get a major label deal? They should stop worrying about getting a major label deal. Ooh. No, I, I mean, even when you're in a major label deal, because, okay, so let me tell you why I say that. Mm. You worry about getting a major label deal and you finally get it. Now you're like, whoo. <laughs> oh, Y'all got it. And that's not how the world works. Oh. So don't worry about the major label deal. Build it and know that they'll come. Mm -hmm. And the label will come also, but the label is gonna come and take a load off of you. Mm -hmm. But if you're built to handle the load, it's like, I, it's like how I looked at my life. Superman is not coming to save us. Mm -hmm. I gotta get out there and do it my damn self. Thanks. It's the same thing. No, if you're working for a label to come, I think you've already lost. Because you're working saying, look look what I'm doing, guys. Yeah. And that's not the world we live in. You need to just be focused on the work. Exactly. And once you focused on that, focus on face forward, audience. Like, okay, I got 100 people out here, good. How do we get 200 people? Not how, did the label see that? Maybe they'll come give me a check. Nah, just work, just just work. Like, even when you have a label, you gotta work. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have a label. Like, it's the game, man. Like, this is your shit. People talk about how much money these labels are making. That's yeah. great. But I guarantee you, capital, because I, I see the little baby plaque, mm -hmm. I guarantee you little baby makes more of little baby than anybody else. Ooh. It's just the tr it's just the truth. It's yeah. just he is the brand. Yeah. And he can also, and he also, because he's putting out music and he's high, he can also be like, how many I'm there? I got five. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Little baby probably on what's fifth already? And he's how long he's been in the game? Like three or four years. He probably ready to put out five projects, four or five projects. Yeah. So at that point, it's like, now they're like, what do you need to be happy? Yeah. What do you need to be better? Mm -hmm. Not, he's not worried about the label, what they give it him. The label's worrying about what he wants and how to make him happy. Yeah. Don't ever worry about the label. The label is up. The label is a business. It's a business that's going to function. Worry about you because you're the business that has to function within their business. Being a part of over 200 million records being sold, Ray, who are your favorite artists to work with and where did you find yourself having to do the most damn work? The most work came from the artists that never made it. Mm. That's the truth. The artists that never make it, those are the ones that take the most work. God because that, no seriously and the artists the, any artists that you work with I mean they're all different I mean I've worked with a lot of artists and what you just notice is is that they know what they are they know what they want they know how to get there you know and to me that's important mm -hmm. 
And your job is to say, okay, let me show you how to get there better. Okay, okay, cool. You got the, okay, let's put the dress to the back. Mm -hmm. Let's put them up in the bun like that. Like just, mm -hmm. you're adjusting, you're helping yep. them. But the hardest ones are the ones you like, why don't you grow dreads? Oh, I don't want dreads. <laughs> why don't you get your hair cut? I don't want that. Why don't you do this? Oh. Those are the ones that make you tired. The yeah. ones that don't make it, though, no, you'll never get tired trying to break an artist that's going to make it because they're going to show up every day like you and them working is going to be what's going to motivate you to want to work harder and that's the honest to God truth artists that have talent that aren't entertainers how do we deal with those folks then Ray artists that have talent that are not entertainers artists that have talent okay <sighs> <laughs> I say, because you know what it is? You know what it is? Okay. Every artist is like a business, right? So let's say, for example, every business, every building we see is like a business, right? Mm -hmm. Some businesses are like, the West End might be Beyonce, you know? Yeah. The tallest building over there might be uh, 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 Jay-Z. or And those little buildings might be somebody else. They're still buildings and have a lot of value. Yeah. At the end of the day, all I can do is take you as far as you're built to go. Mm. So if you're not an entertainer, do you want to be? Mm -hmm. Are you okay not being? Okay, you're okay not being. Okay, let's settle right here then. Let's be a complex. <laughs> you, don't get mad at me if you're not an entire building. Exactly. Don't, you're not going to be Michael Jackson if you ain't no entertainer. Let, listen, let's, and a lot of people are okay with that. Because yeah. there's only been one or two human beings alive that made it as far as Michael Jackson made it. Facts. So that's cool. Though, you have to do what's comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. You have to go, like I said, some people are like, I just want to be the man for now. Some people are like, I just want to be the man forever. So it's just, it's based on you. Mm -hmm. Because the only difference, our business is not based on us. It's based on someone else showing up. That's, people watch, sit here to watch you interview, you need a co-star. Mm -hmm. Nobody come here to hear Bihar talk like, yo, Bihar, tell me about <laughs> exactly. this. You know what I'm saying? So our business is, so when you learn that, you kind of learn. Like you know when you send down somebody what you gonna get. Yeah. You you, you know that already. Mm -hmm. When you work with an artist, you know how far they gonna go. Mm -hmm. And s sometimes they shock you. Yeah. Sometimes they shock you for the good, sometimes they shock you for the bad. Yeah. But you kinda know, cause they tell you, they, they show you who they are. I mean, everybody has a purpose, everybody has a why. I try to find your why, and I try to make sure that, you know, we keep that at the forefront of mm -hmm. where you are in life. And you know, sometimes that why might be, hey bro, I think you should learn how to get on stage and do this. It's like, I mean, I know you probably think it's corny, but I think you should try that. It might help you mm -hmm. two years from now. Okay, cool. I'll think about it. And I'll present it to him a month later. Like, have you thought about that? Because <laughs> you got to move at their pace. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you this, though. If they have a dollar in their pocket, they do that shit. Come on. And that's what I mean by the money is hurting the game. If you got half a million dollars in your pocket. Why are you going to show up and do some shit that you don't have to do? And my answer would be because you want five million dollars in your pocket. Yeah. How do you go about generating money as an artist nowadays, and how much money do they need to be expecting? Uh, artist visions of the check or the bag that they need to get is it higher above the expectations than they are really worth, or how uh, do you know? That's 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 a loaded question. I would say this: get have a number in your head, and but know that number is only going to last you less than a year. Mm. Because once you once you your money changes, your expectation of life changes, people around you change, people around you need, people around you want. So, I mean, that's just on them. I mean, it's hard, but it's really like on them. Like, I see artists like buy, pay their mom house off with that with their first deal. Mm. Like, they ain't sold a record yet. Now, are they the type of artists to be like, wow, whew, I just made it in life? Or are they the <laughs> artists to be like, all right, cool, now I'm gonna buy you a bigger house? Yeah, it you know. You gotta know where you at, you gotta know what you want, and you gotta know, bruh, it's like, uh, are, you, are, you, are you gonna run a sprint or are you gonna run a mar marathon? If an artist is trying to be a millionaire, what is it that they need to have in their repertoire in order to be able to generate that kind of money? You could generate that kind of money in the first six months. Mm. That don't mean you're gonna, you're gonna have a million dollars a year later. Mm. That, 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 that is stamina, it's stamina, like, it's the stamina to run the marathon. It's like, okay, you have a million now, but are you staying in the same place you were staying at when you before you got that million? Probably not. Facts. Are you helping more people out? Probably so. Facts. So that million is gonna be gone soon. So what's the plan when that's gone? And the only reason why you got that million today is because of work you did the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So how about put that work in today so you can get another million 12 months from now? Ooh. 
don't work out of desperation, work out of habit. Mm -hmm. I wake up every day and go to my office no matter what, bro. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I'm gonna wake up and go to my office and I expect my team to be there. Mm -hmm. We might not have nothing on the schedule. We're gonna figure something out though. You know why? Because <laughs> we're in the office. Good boy. We ain't gonna talk about, we ain't gonna go to the to, to the park and play basketball. Yeah. Hell no. You see what I'm saying? It's I'm like it's like muscle, it's like muscle memory. I mm -hmm. train you to show up every day to work, and that's mm -hmm. it. What is it that brings you joy now, Ray? Weekends. <laughs> so you don't like going to your office Monday I, through Friday? No, I love it. I mean, <laughs> but that's because that's my that's my muscle memory. Yeah. You asked me what brings me joy. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing that makes you money might be the same thing that brings you joy. Yeah. When I like working up because I'm a I'm programmed to be a killer. That's right. I'm programmed to wake up in the morning and make money, and I know I got a lot of lives in my hands. So mm -hmm. I'm naturally programmed to get up and make it. Yeah. But what brings me joy is when I can just be a daddy on the weekends yeah. and play with my daughter and my son and watch my kids play and enjoy life. That's mm -hmm. what make that's what brings me joy. Mm -hmm. The game is the game at this point. Mm -hmm. I just know what it takes for me to be in it and I do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I do it better than most and I'm gonna continue. Like I said, the minute that I don't enjoy getting in the ring no more, I'm quitting. Yeah. So I enjoy that part. Mm -hmm. But what brings me joy and happiness is on the weekends when I'm with my kids and my family. Lastly, Ray, what was the best piece of advice that you received and the best piece of advice that you gave? Best piece of advice I received was from a mentor of mine. I don't even talk to him like that anymore because he left the business, but he told me once, I think I mentioned this earlier, I said I had a story to tell you. He told me once, he said, you are moving like a nigga. <laughs> it's a straight black guy. It's a black guy. He said, "You are moving like a nigga." Yeah. He said, and he basically asked me about a deal that he gave uh, that we did. He said, "Where's that money?" And I think my commission on that deal was like seventy five thousand. Mm -hmm. And he said, "That seventy five thousand you made up that deal last year. Where's that money?" He said, "He said, tell the truth, it's gone, right?" I was like, "Most of it, yeah." And he was like, "So you're in my office trying to get another check out of me?" Mm. I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I'm not. I mean, because like I said, I don't mind being told the truth. And yeah. He was like. You moving like a nigga. And I remember, I'll never forget, he said, how old is your son? I said, he just turned one. And he said, if you listen to me, when your son turns 10, you're gonna be great. Mm. And my son turned 10 and I was better than I ever thought I could be. Mm -hmm. And that's because he said, stop doing business like a nigga. Mm -hmm. Niggas are just in these offices trying to get a check from whoever give it to them. Mm -hmm. You need to be a builder so you can give something to your son when he turns 10. And that's what he was referencing. And he taught me that and that changed my whole life. It was like, he started teaching me about deals and how deals work and how to make money and how we make money and how you make money and how you can leverage who you are to make you money today that's gonna be gone tomorrow. You can leverage who you are to make you money tomorrow that's gonna be around forever. Yeah. So which one do you wanna do? And I trusted him and I did it. And it was the best thing ever because it helped me understand business. So that's the best advice somebody ever gave me. It was like, stop moving like a nigga mm -hmm. and start looking at yourself as somebody who's going to be here in 10 years because you Thanks. will be if you'd stop moving like a nigga. <laughs> exactly. Uh, best advice I've ever given was, I mean, I give game all day. I would probably say most important thing is honor your relationships and honor your word. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Like, I'll do something to my own. If I told you I'm going to be there, be high, mm. I would be there to my own detriment. Yeah. I gave you my word, and Next. I and I understand that my word is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Because in this world we live in, you can do right. You could be right for nine years, and that that day one of year ten, if you fuck up, you just killed what you did in those nine years. Yeah. So honor your word at all costs, and do your best. And I promise you, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to learn more. You got to do a lot more than that. But if you do those things, that's right. Because somebody's watching. Like I told you when I sat down, I watch you. I literally watch your interviews. Yes, like, sir. Somebody's watching. Yeah. You never know who's watching. You never know who's watching me. But if they, but they're watching to see who you are in every scenario to mm -hmm. decide. Damn, I might want to put them in a bigger scenario. Yeah. Honor your word. People paying attention. Ray. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brethren. Appreciate you coming through this thing, boss. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime. Wish you nothing but the best and much success. Be high, ready, yo, shouted. Ray Daniels. Holla at y'all in a minute, man. We go. My brother.